So last week we talked about Sukkot, and I pray that all of you have spent some time in the sukkah, or either your own or ours. If not, after services, we will uh, be able to spend some time in the sukkah. And I understand we're serving pizza, very Jewish, of course. <laughs> the only thing more Jewish than that would be Chinese food, but... Um, but uh, so there'll be, uh, so please stay and enjoy uh, and talk to people, find out who they are if you don't know them. Uh, that'd be great. You know, tomorrow we are having a mikvah and we don't, uh, we usually talk about that in services. Um, it's an immersion service for those people who would like to either dedicate their lives to the Lord or rededicate their lives to the Lord. There's um, a flyer in the foyer which tells you where it is. It's at four o'clock. It's in Indian Shores. So, uh, um, so we pray that we'll see you then at 4 o'clock. And if for some reason there's bad weather, um, call Karen. And after the men's and women's uh, fellowship and eating, we're asking you to help uh, take down the sukkah so it'll happen very quickly. Uh, so if you're strong, even if you're not, feel free to stay. And it'll, look, it's a lot of fun to take down the sukkah as well and, and put the uh, various fruits and decorations into the box so we can use them again next year. All right, so as you know, today is the last day of the fall appointed times. I love this season because I just sense the closeness of God in a way that uh, maybe no other time in the year for me. This is, this is like the time where I, I just, uh, there's just been, you know, we've done praise, uh, I mean, we've done uh, fasting and prayer. We, uh, we did Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, um, and, and uh, Yom Kippur and Sukkot, and uh, you know, it's just everything is focused on the Lord. And how would it be if we lived our lives that way? That would be incredible. You know, we talked about Yom Teruah, the shofar blast, and we know in the end of days there will be a shofar blast and, and God will come for his people. We know at that time that Yom Kippur, there will be a, a last chance for people to really receive Yeshua as Lord so that they will have eternal life rather than eternal eternal damnation. And Sukkot, where God finally gathers up his people to tabernacle with them. And then I shared with you last week, and again, we didn't really teach on it, but just gave you the sheet on what I considered the personal spiritual look at these holy days. And so uh, Yom Teruah, we reflect, we recognize, we repent of our sins. And Yom Kippur, we're redeemed as uh, our sins are forgiven and we're reconciled to God and to man. And by the way, let me just say, I, I pray that you are reconciled to man. It's easy to be reconciled to God or easier because God knows what's in your heart. The people you're angry with or they're angry with you, they have no clue what's in your heart. <laughs> and it's hard to be reconciled, but God is calling us to be reconciled. So use this last day. If you're not reconciled with somebody, call them up and just say. Now, by the way, I, I a little off topic, but maybe not. I asked somebody to reconcile with somebody else and they kind of did it like this. I won't use the exact words, but they said, uh, I would like to have a relationship with you again. And then they use the word, but, 
And then they went to, I, and, and I'll do it if you can do this. And I'm going, no! <laughs> Figure everything out later. Reconcile now. Just say, I'm sorry. We should have never stopped talking. And let's, let's just come together and we'll work out the issues as we talk, <laughs> as opposed to not talking, which doesn't really work too well. Okay, I'm sorry, wrong message. Um, so then, if you've totally lost, we're in Yom Kippur, we receive God's love and mercy because we're reconciled to him and reconciled to man. And then Sukkot is a time of rejoicing. And not only do we rejoice, but we remember. Uh, we remember the Lord and we retell about what God's done for us. And the result is we're renewed, we're refreshed, we're revived, and our faith is relevant. And of course, this means we have to apply God's word. So let me go to a little bit of uh, Shemini Atzeret, which is the eighth day. And you, as I mentioned, it's taken from Leviticus 23 and Numbers 29, verse 35. It says, on the eighth day there shall be for you an assembly. You are to do no regular work. And uh, by the way, Taking down the sukkah is no regular work because you don't regularly do that. So feel free to not feel you violated God's word. Just want to help you out here. Now, actually, the word atzeret um, uh, it does not mean day. One would think it would in the way we use it in the English, but it actually means a meal or a festival. And so sometimes the rabbi's interpretation of this language uh, makes you think that they want Sukkot to linger like uh, another meal or something. Um, but I prefer this, this thought uh, having to do with how the rabbis look at things. Uh, the word atzeret comes from atzar, which means to collect or to store. And the rabbi spoke about the purpose of this day was to collect or store our memories of everything that happened from Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, through this time period. I love that thought. The thought, I don't know if any of you have had super times with the Lord in these days, but if you have, remember on those things. Remember what God has done. Remember his appointed times. Store that in your brain so that you can just in be encouraged and strengthened. You know, it's, it's like putting an exclamation part, uh, point on the last day. I, I, I really love that thought. Now, in early uh, Middle Ages, Shemini Atzeret began to be associated with the idea of completing the cycle of readings from the Torah. And so that's what led to the holiday Simcha Torah, which we're also celebrating today, which means rejoice of the law, or Torah can mean instruction, so rejoice in instruction. How many of you rejoice in instruction? I'm just curious. Don't raise your hands. Do you, do you notice sometimes when you're instructing somebody that they go, thanks? Um, we are to rejoice when we are instructed, and this day is all about rejoicing in the instruction that God has given us. Now, the, the number uh, eight is really an interesting number in Scripture. We see that uh, the consecration of Aaron and his sons as priests of God they required seven days of being set apart in Leviticus 8.35, but it was on the eighth day that they were anointed as priests, thus beginning a new ministry. And I believe that... Um, uh, like a few uh, weeks ago, actually longer than that, Vanessa ta and Michael talked about uh, new beginnings. And this is really 
a new beginning. This is the end of the appointed times, and now let's see what God is going to do in our lives. So we see, for instance, that David uh, was the eighth son of Jesse, and he started a new beginning, sort of a new dynasty as he became king, obviously. Um, and we see that in 1 Samuel 16, 10 and 11 and um, so on. And, and after seven weeks of harvest, and, and you know where we're counting the Omer in the spring, the last day is the 50th day of Shavuot and, and becomes Shavuot. And this is also the eighth day of the seventh week. And so the eighth day was not only the beginning of receiving God's law, but also the beginning of receiving his spirit. And it's possible that as Sukkot is the seven-day festival and representing God gathering his people, that the eighth day could represent the millennial reign of Messiah. And we see that in Revelations 20, verse 4, and Isaiah 11. The final thing that I'd like to say about the number eight is Genesis 21.4. It says, then Abraham circumcised Isaac, his son, on the eighth day, just as God had commanded him. So this represents God's covenant with man and also represents our covenant with God. And it, it's like seeing a new beginning of God's faithfulness and our promise to be faithful. And if for some reason uh, this year has been a tough year for you spiritually, this is the day to start afresh and anew. In fact, tomorrow, what an amazing way to start a new beginning if you were immersed and you dedicated your year coming up to the Lord because you've gone through these appointed times. What a blessing that would be. So, on the eighth day, we also celebrate, obviously, Simcha Torah. Well, that's what we're doing today. It, normally, it's done the day after the eighth day. But as I said, it means rejoicing in the Torah. And I also mentioned to you that it marks the completion of the annual cycle of the weekly Torah reading. Now, all of you should have received in your announcements the Torah readings for this next year. Okay, so if you look at the white sheet, it will give you all the Torah readings, including the Holy Days. It's a wonderful way to, to um, read and study scripture. And it even has the New Covenant, and not only does it have the Haftorah, it also has the New Covenant listed there. Now, if you are really industrious, and you want to read the Bible in one year, we also, in the uh, uh, foyer, have a uh, list of how to read the Bible in one year. So feel free to take that as well. So Simcha Torah, the, the thing that's so amazing about this holiday is that it really shows the importance of God's word in Jewish life. It's both uh, the source of identity, but it's also the fact that this is a precious gift. And just think, this is a gift that has been kept going for thousands of years. That's a long time for a gift to be useful. And so the Jewish people were entrusted with this gift. And you know, the way a gift works best is you give it to other people. And so God had the Jewish people not only receive the gift, but let it be the foundational gift for all of his instruction. Pretty fascinating. And that's why we have so much joy today, because we received a gift. And we should have great joy 
because we're learning spiritual lessons like repentance. Yeah, that's always fun. Forgiveness, character development, obedience, faith, fruit of the spirit. Um, we're, we're just becoming more mature spiritually. I love what D.L. Moody said about scripture. He said, the Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. And so we want to be transformed by God's word. I like to say, we don't want to change God's word. We want God's word to change us. When I think of transformation, I think of the one who transforms us, and I always want to read Yochanan, John 1, during Simcha Torah. It just, for me, it just works. So let's look at John 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word. Okay, that's clear, right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. I don't know how you all interpret this, but I'm kind of believing that the Word was God and God was the Word and they were there in the beginning. <laughs> so then it says, He was with God in the beginning. So now we're talking about an individual who is with God in the beginning. And then in verse 3 it says, All things were made through Him. And apart from him, nothing was made that has, be, that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I, I just love this. Makes me think of Hanukkah, right? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. And the word which is God, became flesh and tabernacled among us. We looked upon his glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. So I just find this amazing. And, and, and we see in the book of Revelation uh, this truth. You know, <laughs> we as believers we place an extremely high value on the words given to us by God because God's word, it's the truth. And his truth is to be burned into our minds and engraved in our hearts. We're to recognize the word of God is Yeshua and he was in the beginning. Now, Revelation 1.8 says, and I believe this is Yeshua speaking, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says Adonai Elohim, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so when people say that Yeshua never says that he is deity, I believe this is one of many examples where he does say who he is. Because he is the living Torah. He is the living Torah. So what are the responsibilities of, of ha being serious about Scripture? For us, number one, we should read daily. Number two, we should study it. Number three, we should meditate on it. Number four, we should pray Scripture. Thank you for the shout-out last night, Ravi. Uh, as, as he talked about one of the things about praying Scripture. Number five, we should declare scripture. Number six, we should memorize scripture. Number seven, and maybe most importantly, we should apply scripture. We should apply it to our lives. Okay, so, um, you know, we read from Deuteronomy 34, 9 through 12, and that, is, uh, that every portion that is read has a name to it. And the name actually comes from the first line of that portion. So even though we read Deuteronomy 34, 9 through 12, the portion actually begins in Deuteronomy 33. It is called Vizot Habracha. And that means, and this is the blessing. 
And so if you go back to Deuteronomy 33, 1, it says, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed B'nai Yisrael before his death. Now, interesting enough, in Deuteronomy 34, 9 through 12, it talks about the first smicha. You know what a smicha is? Smicha is an ordination, right? Moses lays his hands on Joshua and says, you're the man, right? That's an ordination. That's a smicha laying hands on somebody and sending them out to be a leader. And it's important in our congregation and all congregations to raise up young people that we can do that with and, and people who are going to be Joshua's and Caleb's. And one of the things as I was looking at Joshua, uh, I just want to mention something as to what was impressive about him. If you were to read Exodus 17, 9 through 14, you would see that Moses asked Joshua to go into battle. And uh, Joshua said, sure, you know. And so what do we see about jo uh, Joshua? We see he obeyed Moses even though he was going into harm's way. He had faith that Moses heard from God. In other words, Joshua was loyal. He was also respectful. And he believed in God's order and that God set up leadership. He was willing to fight because he believed that God was with him. And God chose Joshua. And Josh, Joshua was dedicated to the Lord. You know, the, when, when Moses was on the mountain the second time, and, and uh, Joshua stayed in the tent of meetings so that he could pray, Joshua was a man of God. So I believe we are to pray for our youth to become Joshua's, and Caleb's, we are to pray that we will all study God's word to be approved by him. Let us pray that we will apply and follow God's word because it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Let us pray that God's word becomes our nourishment. And, and let's actually look at 2 Timothy as we close, the 3, 16, and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for restoration, for training in righteousness. By the way, let's stop there for a second. It's all the things that are mentioned here are the things that are God's heart, because that's what Scripture is good for. So let's look at it again. Teaching, reproof or correction, restoration, meaning that we are to be restored to God and man, for righteousness, and that the person belonging to God may be capable, fully equipped for every good deed. Finally, let God's word, if we don't get anything else from today, be engraved in our hearts so that if we don't have love, we understand that we are just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Because in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, above all, Everybody understand above all? Above all. Okay, so everything else is below, right? If it's above all, yes? Okay. Above all, keep your love for one another constant, for love covers a multitude of sins. Love never fails. Let me close by saying this. God's word is 
filled with what he wants us to know. In Isaiah 9, 5 and 6, it says, For to us a child is born, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, my Father of Eternity and Prince of Peace. So we understand that this child will be born and he becomes the Mighty God. And then it says, of the increase of his government and the peace, or shalom, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it through justice and righteousness from now until forevermore. How long is forevermore? Forevermore, yes. The zeal of Adonai Tzivaot will accomplish it, which means that this, this child, his righteousness goes forth into eternity. Now, who is this child? Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 says, But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement for our shalom was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We are all like sheep. We have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. So Adonai has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I believe the one who, who's taken our iniquity is clearly Yeshua. So if there is anybody here who has not received Yeshua into their life, or there is anybody listening on Facebook Live who has not received Yeshua into their life, follow God's word. We're talking about today, we're talking about God's word on Simcha Torah and what his word says. And here in the Hebrew scriptures, as we looked at Isaiah in two different portions, it is clearly about Yeshua, the Messiah. So follow God's word and receive Yeshua as Messiah. Just say, I repent, I'm sinned, I'm sorry. I believe Yeshua is the atonement, for, he is the atonement for my sin. I receive Yeshua as my Lord of my life and I dedicate my life to him. And say those words and when you say that from the bottom of your heart, you are a child of God's. So I'd like to end my portion of this service. Let's uh, do one worship song, maybe the blessing. Thank you, my dear. We're ready. So come right up. First Chronicles 22:19. Say it with me. Now set your hearts and souls to seek after Adonai, your God. One more time with a little more oomph. Now set your hearts and souls to seek after Adonai, your God. Amen.